Thank you everyone for coming uh, to this section of how do we go ahead with the uh, changing landscape of the publication. Um, so this time it's uh, hosted between me and Ailish who works at eLife and she's a communi communications manager at eLife. And so we got three fantastic speakers. Uh, first is Anna Akmanova, and then we got Hannah Drury who's product manager at eLife. And then we have Sa Daniela Saderi who is a co-founder and director of Pre-Review. So I'll start by introducing um, Anna Akmanova. I'm sure if you work in the field of cytoskeleton, you know of uh, Anna's work, uh, but uh, I'd, I'd emphasize her role in eLife. Uh, Anna has been a deputy editor at eLife since 2018. Uh, she's currently a professor of cell biology at the Department of Biology at Faculty of Science, Utrecht University in Netherlands. Uh, she studied biochemistry and molecular biology at Moscow State University, Russia, and, ob uh, and obtained her PhD from University of Nijmegen, if I'm saying it right, Anna, just correct me from Nijmegen. Then. Nijmegen, okay, yeah. uh, uh, Netherlands. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm sure she's going to emphasize on things that are intrinsically, um, you know, uh, an outcome of the of the whole preprint culture that has come up in the recent years and how eLife is embracing the new ways of doing peer review. Anna, take it over. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, simple for the nice introduction. Thank you for joining. Uh, so what I would like to do in the coming 10 minutes is tell you a little bit about eLife and mostly about indeed how eLife is embracing the new era of preprints and how we are trying to make uh, preprints more visible and better used in the community and how we are trying to improve the use of the uh, preprints and their usefulness. But let me start by the beginning. So I will start first with eLife. eLife is a, a journal publishing all across life sciences from uh, medicine to plant sciences, from biophysics to cell biology, from neuroscience, actually to all other areas of life sciences. It has been established in 2012 as a non-profit led by researchers for the benefit of science and scientists and funded by several um, very prominent funders starting with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, uh, Wellcome Trust and Max Planck. Um, there was also some additional funding from Wallenberg Foundation since 2018 and research funders provide the strategic strategic guidance and resources to allow researchers to run eLife. And the purpose of eLife is to drive reform in research communication. So the idea of eLife is that it is a selective journal, which means that we uh, select research that we uh, publish and we publish research that we think is generally interesting and important. It is fully run by scientists. So um, funders provide us some funds, but the, uh, all the running of the journal and all the decisions are taken by scientists. So the current leadership consists of Mike Eisenhower who is our editor-in-chief, and five deputy editors, and I'm one of them. I'm representing cell biology and um, some uh, related areas of biology. We have a very large scientific editorial board, which currently includes more than 600 reviewing editors and uh, approximately 80 senior editors. And these are the people who actually make decisions, who read the papers that are sent to eLife, who select the papers to be published and handle uh, the papers, the peer review process and all the decisions. Uh, so just to give you the idea of the size of the journal, we are receiving currently approximately 700 papers a month across all areas of life sciences and we publish approximately 100 papers a month. And the percentage of papers that we publish is about 15% of what we receive have, uh, has been very stable, although the journal has been growing. But our main goal is not just to publish papers, but to innovate and experiment, experiment in um, scientific publishing. And in this way, to 
influence how publishing works across life sciences. Just let me give you a few small examples. So probably one thing that eLife has introduced and that has broadly influenced how journals work these days, at least in life sciences, is consultative peer review. Consultative peer review is a process whereby um, a paper is reviewed as in most journals by, let's say, two, between two and four reviewers, but the reviews not just go back to the editor for a decision, but first the reviewers and the editor meet virtually in a kind of a chat box and discuss the paper with each other. They know each other's name and they collectively make a decision on whether the paper should be accepted, rejected, or revised. And most importantly, they collectively make a decision on which revisions, if the paper is invited for revision, are really essential. Because one of the main goals of starting in life was to curb the number of revisions and revision cycles that the paper goes through before it's published. So basically, these people will be asking each other, okay, uh, John, you have asked for uh, this list of revisions, but are they really necessary? Do these people really need to make another transgenic plant line or another transgenic mouse? Do they need to redo all the other experiments on the new microscope? And very often, this discussion amounts to that actually a lot of the requests were kind of good to do, but not essential. And so in the end, people get a single list of requested revisions. And in this way, so the process is uh, quicker and more organized. And also unreasonable requests of reviewers are reduced. So that's one example I gave, I gave you of how eLife has broadly influenced how publishing works, because many journals have now adopted, at least in some way, this kind of model. We try to publish um, papers quickly, and we make the decision letter and the author responses also public. But let me now move to what we are doing now. So the biggest change that has occurred in uh, life sciences publishing since the last, I would say, maybe five years is the adoption and ac acceptance of preprints. Preprints have been the most normal thing in the world in physics and mathematics for a very long time, but not in life sciences. And you can see here, so these are statistics for bioarchive. So in, starting from 2016, the number of preprints have been growing. And I can just say for my lab, we haven't been publishing uh, preprints uh, like uh, five years ago. Now, it, in my lab, it is unthinkable that we would submit a paper without uh, you know, posting a preprint first. And this is, I know this is the same for a lot of colleagues. Now, there have been a lot of reservations about med biomedical and particularly medical papers, because people were saying, yeah, if a paper is not reviewed, it shouldn't be uh, online if it has medical content, because it is dangerous. People People will start adopting what is in it, and it hasn't seen the light of peer review. But this attitude has been dramatically changed last year, and this huge surge in preprinting came because of COVID. When COVID happened, a lot of there was a huge wave of papers. There was a pandemic, I would say, of publications uh, being submitted, and nobody, no journal could handle them. People wanted to bring them out quickly because that was essential, um, so that the information was disseminated quickly. And that's where Med Archive, that was slowly starting um, in 2020, suddenly surged. And now preprints are also a big reality in the medical world. Now, what are the advantages of preprints? Uh, currently, the big preprint servers like BioArchive are for free. Uh, the, your paper, if you post it, is published within one or two days, and it can facilitate um, a progression of career and networking opportunities for early career researchers. For example, most of the uh, people who are now submitting, let's say, uh, uh, fellowships, uh, 
proposals or go for their first job, like the first academic job, usually have preprints at the top of their publication list because it takes a while to publish your paper in a journal and you can show that at least you have a paper and everyone can read it. It gives uh, visibility to work, it helps to establish priority and what is very nice, you get feedback. So um, very often you get comments, sometimes formal, sometimes informal from colleagues once you have posted a preprint. And what is nice about preprints, they are flexible. You can update them, you can revise them, you can re submit different versions of a preprint. And in this way, so your paper becomes a living thing that can gradually improve based on the feedback of, the, of your peers. Preprints are broadly adopted by funders, starting from very big ones like NIH, but Medical Research Council in the UK, and also ERC and many others. So uh, a lot of fund funders across the world adopt them. There have been mm, uh, hesitation with adopting preprints in Australia, which is of course uh, relevant uh, from uh, for um, uh, you guys, but also Australian Research uh, Council has actually uh, changed uh, um, their policies based probably on the pressure from the research community. Now, just to give you an idea of what we are trying to do. So the current publishing system works like this. So it starts with sending a paper for peer review and peer reviews are written for editors and authors. And after that, so after passing one more or multiple rounds of peer review, paper is accepted to a journal and that's a kind of a curation. The paper gets a quality stamp, this is a nature paper, this is a plus one paper or whatever. And then the paper is disseminated and published. Now these cycles can take months and sometimes even years. The if we would move to the so-called publish review cur curate system, then it will look different because you start with dissemination. You publish the paper as a preprint and the authors decide when they publish. You don't have to wait. And then what you could do, you could review paper and review it publicly. And only after that, based on the input, maybe from different parties, <coughs> the, it will be decided, okay, how important this paper actually is. So you start with a preprint server, and then ideally you would have an open and transparent peer review of papers that are freely available, that can be discussed by multiple groups. And then uh, there would be a round of curation where the value of the paper could be decided by the community. So the advantages of this model is that the authors would control uh, how and when their work is shared. And the evaluation of science, which is very important, is divorced from its publication. And because of that, it can be richer and more transparent. Uh, let's say that in an ideal world, if there are no journals, and you just have review panels, your paper could be reviewed by the review panel of Nature and Science and uh, eLife and some other journals. So in principle, there is no pressure to have just one set of reviewers reviewing uh, your paper. And the peer review in this case is not meant to decide whether the paper is placed in a journal or not, but to help the authors and to help the readers evaluate what is in the paper. And if, of course, if the peer review would be more open and transparent, so the, the quality and the style of peer review would change. Uh, so because it would need to um, adapt to the uh, necessities of public discourse. And in at the end, so if this process evolves, it could lead to alternatives to journal titles as the currency for the quality of research and career currency, because I think everyone agrees that the current system has big disadvantages. Okay, so eLife is trying to make progress towards this vision, which we think is the vision for future. So our current process is that we 
only review papers which are posted as a preprint and uh, we uh, produce so because people still need at this moment publication in a journal so we still offer the publication in eLife but at the same time we are working towards the new world where the peer review would be happening with a preprint on the preprint server and so we are generating both so we generate public content which includes a public evaluation summary and peer reviews to be posted alongside the preprint and the principle there is that we it, this is done for the readers so we review the paper as it stands so we try to tell the readers what is in the paper what is good about it and if if needed what are the flaws what are the problems with the paper but in a constructive polite and uh, respectful way at the same time we also do what the journal would do we provide constructive feedback to authors private recommendations on how they can improve their paper and we still do consultative peer review and so we also generate an alive decision accept revise or reject and for revised decisions we still come up with a single list on how the mm, authors would need to improve their paper in order to um, uh, make it acceptable for eLife. So the outcome of our process is a short summary, which mm, people could in principle use for their grant or job application saying, let's say it's a fantastic paper describing a new method to visualize cells in three dimensions. And then there would be public reviews, which would provide a, um, a balanced uh, overview of the paper and the authors get the possibility to respond. Um, if they choose to the um, to these uh, public comments and then there is a like with any journal an e-life decision and recommendations to authors um, and for rejected papers we still aim that the public content that we have generated so the evaluation summary and public reviews will be eventually published along the preprint but if the authors uh, cannot proceed with the publishing paper in eLife, so we um, can uh, delay the posting of these uh, um, public reviews until the paper is accepted in another journal, so that the possibility for the authors to publish their paper is not damaged by the criticism which is provided in these public reviews. So for this new system to work, of course, we need to work it out. We need to make it work well, and we need the community to get involved with this and help us to see how we can shape this system better. And so now I would like to give the word to, um, I guess, uh, Daniela or Hannah, who would then continue discussing how we do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so next I would like to introduce Hannah Drury. Um, Hannah is the eLife product manager who will present on Society, a new platform supporting crowdsourced organization of the growing preprint literature. Hannah will discuss how we can enable open evaluation and curation for a positive change in academic publishing. Perfect. Thanks, Eilish. Um, as you said, my name's Hannah Drury. I'm a product manager for eLife um, and around 18 months ago I was invited to join a cross-functional team and the, the mantle was kind of handed down to us to build the technology to facilitate this PRC workflow that, that we've just heard Anna um, speaking about. Um, so by the end of today's panel um, we'll have heard about the review models and the philosophies of two initiatives, um, eLife and, and pre-review. Um, and both of those initiatives are working hard to build the, the reputation of preprints. And I consider society, the, the product, to be another cog in that, that great machine, if you like. Um, and it's one that makes the evaluation outputs of, of eLife pre-review and many others more easily discoverable. So Anna, as I said, has, has already introduced us to the, the publish with new curate model of, of publication. So I won't I won't go into 
into detail about that again but i did just want to use this this particular pipeline to illustrate exactly where where society fits and and that's across these these last two stages the, the review and curation stages um, so far we've, we've delegated the, the publication side um, the, the concerns of publication to, to preprint servers um, but interestingly as we've progressed in our discovery of the problem space um, we have become increasingly more aware of the overlap between review and, and curation and society really sits at the, at the junction. So we know that while the rise in preprint use has been a huge win for science, as, as Anna said, it, it has made it even harder to keep on top of the latest developments in your particular field of expertise. There's an overwhelming amount of information available and there's very little to help decide what to pay attention to or where to invest your, your limited reading time. So society the product it offers the opportunity to contribute to and to benefit from the peer-driven organization of the literature thanks to publicly curated lists and the aggregation of open evaluations from a number of different groups of experts uh, we hope to help you see what your peers find interesting and most importantly to discover your next read so first let's let's shine a light on uh, evaluation within society on society we only display evaluations from groups of experts um, so that's that's rather than than individuals and we class a group as being a collection of people who evaluate and curate preprints together um, that that group may have formed from existing networks or out of a relationship with an organization such as eLife and we currently harvest their evaluations from wherever that group has elected to host them um, so that could be via like hypothesis um, a custom rss feed or, or another method um, for one of our groups we, we even integrate with a, um, a public google sheet um, preprint evaluations on society take many forms um, from automated screenings covering reproducibility to the more familiar multi-part review consolidated by a single editor and this is this is exactly why we landed on the word um, evaluation uh, as a descriptor. You'll, you'll notice that I haven't haven't been using the word review so far um, because the term evaluation is is more abstract. And we felt that it allowed for a greater scope than the word review, which kind of itself, it carries a lot of legacy. Um, it has a lot of um, existing existing baggage, existing understanding around it. Um, but as long as the final output is transparent, we're completely agnostic um, with regards to the process that each group adopts. Uh, and that allows the reader to, to benefit from multiple perspectives, the reader and, and the author to, to benefit from multiple perspectives while formulating their own opinion of the work. Uh, and you can just see on this slide, I've, I've collated together some of the groups uh, whose evaluations are currently displayed on site. Journal publication. Um, usually relies on one positive consolidated review of a manuscript um, but but why should this be the case particularly when the entire process commonly takes place behind closed doors and therefore lacks um, a sense of accountability on society we don't limit the number of evaluations that an article can accumulate um, meaning that we we do have examples on society where more than one group has in fact evaluated the same paper each evaluation is openly available um, and it's possible for the reader to indicate whether or not they found the comments helpful in their own assessment of the work. Um, and this, of course, allows for voices other than those of journal editors to be heard. And authors, meanwhile, they, they benefit from receiving feedback early from a number of sources, as well as the chance to reach a wider audience with their work that is, is publicly available as soon as they themselves deem it ready. The events surrounding each preprint, uh, including evaluations and version history, uh, they're presented as a stream of activity alongside the title and abstract. And in this way, society calls into question the notion that any scientific work is finished at the point of publication. Post-publication review, revision and curation mean that the preprint can continue to evolve as a kind of living document without necessarily reaching completion. And at every step of the way, that history is completely transparent. So we've spoken um, a little bit about evaluation. So, so what about curation? 
Well, public uh, creation and management of lists of related preprints is an area that, that we're currently exploring um, because we've heard in our, our user testing how heavily researchers rely on recommendations from trusted individuals or, or particular leading lights within their field to match preprints to those who would, who would find value in them. Uh, and we've learned that, that group evaluations, while they're helpful, they just aren't enough of a differentiator to, to really organise the, the preprint literature in a, in a meaningful way. Um, so this, this is what a list currently looks like on Society. Um, we have plans in the medium term to make them more robust by allowing a curator to customise titles and descriptions, uh, as well as add additional comments to accompany each preprint that's added to the list. I've said that, that Society is a tool for, for busy researchers, um, but, but how does that, that work in practice? Society's unique value uh, lies in the underlying network of evaluation and curation events around preprints that powers our vision of passive discovery. If important new preprints are surfaced to you every time you visit Society, rather than you having to perform the same manual searches over and over again in order to keep on top of the latest developments in your field. The first part of this network is the, the list of evaluated preprints um, generated by group activity. We've heard, as I said, that, that this activity can take many forms. Uh, for example, automated screenings, um, multi-part peer reviews, and all of these are, are aggregated from different sources. And they all act as trust indicators that allow readers to make informed decisions about the content. Users can then elect to follow particular groups that are evaluating preprints in their area of expertise. Uh, and this means that new evaluations from those groups are going to be pushed under your radar with, with every return visit to society. Once you've found a, a preprint of interest, um, you can save it to your reading list so you can easily come back to it later. Uh, and that list itself is also publicly available. Uh, which means it can be used to benefit others, um, such as your such as your own lab. Um, and we've seen examples of of labs sharing lists of preprints with each other in this way. Um, so I say you can indicate if you found a particular group evaluation helpful, um, and this provides a, a simple way of of demonstrating for those groups what what a good public review looks like. Uh, at the moment, the, the network is limited um, by the number of curation and evaluation activities an individual or group can perform, um, but we do have big plans moving forward. I just wanted to cover um, just, just a few of those um, as, we, as we finish off this morning. As we layer on top more robust individual curation, um, in other words, the, the highlighting of particularly significant preprints in public lists, we see that the network starts to develop even more links. You might consider this activity a form of light curation, uh, sorry, a form of light evaluation, um, particularly if we consider the possibility of custom names and, and descriptions of these lists. If, um, if a preprint appears in a list entitled top, top neuroscience papers of 2021, um, then if you're a neuroscientist, um, that, that paper may be something that you want to pay particular attention to. What about groups that are both evaluating and curating? Um, well, groups, of course, they, they should be able to collect together lists of preprints to reflect, for example, um, papers that they've found particularly groundbreaking um, while they've been evaluating them, or papers that they're considering for review, um, but they haven't got around to yet. Um, and that might help that group's particular followers to, to stay ahead of the game. And it's really in bringing all of these activities together uh, and using them to start linking relevant preprints with those who would most benefit from reading them that, that size you really does begin to become valuable. As you uh, as a user follow groups, people and lists, um, society begins to surface and highlight more and more of the preprints that matter to you. And in turn, you're encouraged to save these preprints to your own public lists, making even more links um, in the network. So just finishing up, um, we're developing society completely in the open um, and we rely on feedback from users to help determine how we can best achieve our aims while solving problems for, for you as scientists. Um, and with that in mind, I, I would 
I'd encourage you to take a look at, at the application today. Um, you can find us at society.org um, and to sign up to our mailing list, uh, which will help you keep abreast of the latest updates. Um, you can find us on, on Twitter and Facebook at, at Society HQ as well. And thank you very much. I look forward to, uh, to any discussion. Thank you very much, Tana. And with that, I, now I'd like to introduce Daniela Sidiri. Uh, Daniela holds a PhD in neuroscience. Uh, she is a former Mozilla Fellow for Science and co-founder and director of Peer Review. Uh, Daniela will now discuss Peer Review and how we can empower the next generation of peer reviewers. Thank you so much, uh, Elish, for the introduction and Anna and Hannah for your um, wonderful talks that preceded me. Um, and also um, the Monash Universities and, and uh, Senzil for uh, inviting me. Um, okay, let's get to it. Uh, first, I just want to mention that the slides are available um, and then can be um, uh, used and reused under CC BY 4.0 at pre review um, uh, dash Monash and the bit.ly link. So you're welcome to go there. Um, I don't need further introduction of myself, except that you might realize from my accent that I'm actually Italian, but I am talking to you from Portland, Oregon in the United States. Um, you're welcome if anyone is on Twitter to anything that I say, even though it's 11 p.m., so I'm not sure <laughs> you really want to, to tweet it at Neurosarda or at Tree Review um, underscore. Um, everything that I'm going to tell you uh, about today, about our work at Pre-Review, is not just uh, me, but it's also the hard work of the rest of the leadership team, including uh, Dr. Monica Granados, Samantha Hindle, um, and also Katrina Murphy and Antoinette Foster, who have um, joined us uh, at different times uh, helping us with, uh, with this project. Um, so, and we heard a lot about the uh, the wonderful uh, uh, work that eLife and Anxiety um, are, are doing into bringing this new model of uh, peer review to uh, scholarly communication. Um, uh, we uh, start always with like, what are, what are the, the driving problems that we see um, uh, in, in the peer review system and how are we trying to, to address it? Uh, so before I even tell you about what peer review is, I just wanted to, to just briefly mention um, what are the, the drivers um, uh, of our work. And so we def definitely see, um, as a, we are not a journal, but as an independent uh, organization that, that we have you know, and of researchers of ourselves, the pool of reviewers is um, uh, small and uh, the many editors we've talked to uh, often uh, have complained about the insufficient number of reviewers and, and, and review requests, especially in during COVID uh, times. Um, and the composition of this reviewer pool is uh, very homogeneous, uh, very oftentimes, even though it can be difficult to quantify with a, a blind process, but if you look at the editorial um, uh, pool, uh, tends to be um, a very homogeneous and also selected uh, uh, quite often in a you know, quite opaque way. Um, uh, and these reviewers are obviously selected as experts in the field. And yet uh, there is not a universal training that we as researchers receive at any point in our career, at least not in the program and that I've been through um, in how to do a peer review. And so it's this assumption that we are experts just because we, we, we know about our research, but like we believe the peer review is more than, um, uh, than, than privilege or and practice or, or um, years of experience in your own um, um, uh, in your own field of research. Um, and also these, these reviews and all this time uh, goes often unrecognized. Um, so uh, a pre-review, we, we started in, in 2017 with this idea of uh, really uh, trying to bring together um, uh, researchers and kind of re-empower with the power that they, we already have of being uh, the, the center of, uh, of, of peer review and, and the center of um, evaluations um, and, and really bring that peer back to, uh, to the peer review world. And as we grew and kind of developed what we wanted to do, we're very, still a very small organization. Um, we really decided and, and, and thought deeply about wanting to uh, truly bring openness to, to the scholarly peer review process, but also center in this process um, uh, equity in the sense of like really recognizing who are the groups that are uh, left behind uh, and very often in this process of, of scholarly communications and, 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 and um, academia. 
and uh, put the, uh, the, 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 the needs of researchers at the, at the center. Um, so the, the work that we do, and I apologize if I'm rumbling a little bit, it's, it's a little late, um, but the, the center of the, the work we do, it can be uh, thought about um, around three pillars, as we call them. And so we um, uh, bring community together through uh, training programs. And so this is like kind of a two in response to the need of the lack of, um, uh, of training that we have seen as researchers of ourselves. I'm also talking to researchers around the world. Um, and uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about them uh, during this presentation. We also organize a collaborative sessions of uh, when we basically bring researchers from all over the world to uh, review a preprint um, uh, together um, during uh, an hour, an hour and a half of a facilitated call. And then we use the fruits of the discussion to compose a review um, and uh, share it with the authors and often uh, also share it um, uh, openly online in uh, the platform that we have been developing for the past four years now. Um, the platform is uh, open source and it's an open infrastructure, uh, but really what we're trying to do um, with the platform is to create a home for the communities that we want to see uh, thrive and develop around uh, open preprint review. And uh, the, one of the main questions that we asked ourselves as not uh, as software developers or designers, um, but it was really trying to understand who are we, why, if we're trying to embark in this, this was 2017, of designing a platform to allow anyone to review preprints, who, what are the, the issues that we're trying to solve and what are the, the shared values of the, of the researchers and the people that really we expect uh, to come and, um, uh, and collaborate on a preprint review. And, and one of the key issues that we couldn't turn our, definitely our, our back um, to is that we really wanted to, to center this idea of like using an equity lens to, to, um, to kind of build this, this new um, uh, community of preprint reviewers and not um, shy away from uh, the recognitions that a lot of, uh, oftentimes a lot of new projects, even if they're developed in the open, um, they, it, try, it tends to um, uh, not recognize some of the issues that have been already existing in previous processes and they're trying to be reproduced in the open. And this is not nobody's fault, it's just the way that we are uh, bring our own biases and when our own um, thoughts and experiences to even the idea creation. And so we've been trying to be, um, of course, with a, not, not being perfect, but trying to be very open and did a lot of um, uh, interviews and uh, one on one with many researchers. And, and we still try to approach partnerships from this um, uh, point of view of like opportunity and creating collaboration. Um, so I'm gonna, I don't have a lot of time to explain a lot of the, uh, to show a lot of the features that are in the platform, but I just wanna highlight some of the main ones. Um, this is a, uh, a screenshot of the, just the front page of the, uh, of, of the pre-review platform. And the, um, the key element here is that we're not a preprint server. We do not host preprints, very similar to what Society, uh, we leave that to the, to the great work that many preprint servers are doing. But what the opportunity here is for anyone with an ORCID ID to um, provide a review of, um, uh, of a preprint that has a DOI. In this case, the first one that comes up here is a MedArchive preprint that um, had uh, six uh, what we call rapid reviews, and I'm gonna tell you in a minute what they are. Um, and also this um, uh, request for review. So a user can also, we like to call them pre-reviewers, um, as the opportunity to request reviews so that others can um, recognize that request and, and possibly address it. If they have the time, um, the um, the two kind of reviews that can be done on re on pre reviews are a, a rapid um, a questionnaire that can be filled up with um, uh, very potentially very very quickly if uh, someone has obviously read the preprint um, and um, and these questions have been really designed to capture the essence the essence of the preprint uh, and then. If uh, the pre-reviewer has more uh, time or if they are reviewing, um, they're preventing in a group, for example, this was uh, a review that was written by uh, six different people that were together doing one of those collective uh, collaborative reviews process that I told you <coughs> about, excuse me. 
then you can write what we call full pre-review. So that is just free text um, that can uh, that is then published and gets a UI via uh, Zenodo. Um, they, one of the main responses in terms of like wanting to open up peer review and, and uh, do this in the open is that we cannot assume that we can do that without thinking about this opening up to vulnerable communities. And as an early career researcher myself, when we started this, I was still a PhD student. I remember my first posting, I was incredibly scared. And so I, I even though I knew that I didn't want to continue in academia, I remember really like, we need to provide a way to be anonymous, but we also need to provide a way for someone to um, uh, be accountable for uh, the comments and, and the activity they may have in a public platform. So we came up with this um, kind of idea where every pre-reviewer um, gets two different personas at the login. And one is a, a public associated with your ORCID ID and your list of publications is and uh, anything that is public on ORCID gets important in your profile. So you can keep track and, and with this idea that eventually, you know, there is going to be more and more recognition of uh, contributions to peer review that, that re researchers can use to advance in their career. But also this possibility of posting a review and a comment as anonymously with, uh, well, it's a pseudonym that gets associated to your profile uh, when you create it. Um, and so what that allows is that uh, by using the pseudonym, you can still contribute, you can still share your profile with uh, a third party that you trust. Um, and but you um, if there is a violation of the code of conduct that is reported by the by other pre reviewers, uh, by other community members, then the accountability element is still there as the uh, pseudonym is associated with um, the public profile on our end. So there is that element. So far, we have not had that problem, but uh, we wanted to make sure that we can create um, a space that um, would feel safe and not just um, a place where everybody can just feel like it and judge in, in the way that uh, they want. Um, and so here is where I think, you know, that the platform was something that honestly, like, um, uh, funders were very interested in, and we were interested in creating this home for a community that wasn't still there. But uh, my heart and our heart, uh, especially in the work that we've been doing with eLife in the past year, has been really trying to also um, advance this um, process of, of, of training and creating mentorship opportunity for researchers. And so uh, eLife was the, uh, uh, the major uh, sponsor of our pilot open reviewers program that um, uh, went on uh, in the fall of 2020. And this was uh, a cohort basing a cohort based training program in which we uh, paired early career researchers with little to no experience in peer review with uh, journal editors who volunteered um, to be uh, to be mentors. And the uh, in, the in opportunity here was not only to be mentored one on one, but also to have a peer to peer to peer uh, learning that would happen every week and kind of building the uh, the, the skills and, and the confidence in uh, the early career researchers in being them coming back to the program if they wanted to as mentors themselves. And we um, uh, intentionally integrated in the in, in educational focus on um, uh, like exposing like uh, problems that, that uh, we see at the structural level or of our society and um, also uh, how do we we see the repercussion of that into our systems and even the peer review process and trying to figure out how can we um, uh, assess our own biases as peer reviewers and then address it um, uh, at the same time. Um, so some of the uh, uh, the work that came out and the resources that we created, particularly Dr. Antoinette Foster was here, was uh, key for this. Uh, we published um, what we uh, call the uh, reviewer uh, guide. And this is just a, um, a very detailed step-by-step -step, uh, review guide that uh, can allow a researcher uh, that is, has not much experience to, um, uh, to do their first review. Um, and be guided through it. And here I just wanted to highlight that um, after many iterations, even when the, the pilot early career researchers giving us feedback, we recognize that really this process starts and ends with a self-reflection and with uh, assessment of our own, checking our own biases and how they come in. And it's so, so interesting to see how when we have those collective and, and um, collaborative sessions, uh, a lot of, um, of us and, and researchers like realize things that they have not 
perhaps seen uh, until uh, it was come and talked through. So there is this really important uh, part that we think um, can come from having uh, collaborative review discussions. Um, this is just a, the uh, part of the Refle bias reflection guide that we also published, and it's just a process that um, we, we believe is um, helpful to go through. But I don't have, obviously, time right now to, uh, to go through this, but I just wanted to show it so that if this is of an interest to you, these are all available openly on Zenodo under uh, open licenses. And there are these three guides, guides that um, we, we want to iterate upon with researchers. Uh, so if these are of any news, please uh, check them out. And the links are in the presentation. Um, the last thing, and I think I'm taking way too much time now that I'm seeing the time. So I apologize for that. But um, I wanted to um, bring up some of the opportunities that we have been working with, especially with eLife. And so those are basically re, uh, adapting the content of the reviewers in the training uh, to a workshop um, a type, but also working in partnership with other organizations that are actually doing the work in their own communities, such as Africa Archive, this is the African Aid in Africa, uh, to adapt the, the context of this training um, and it, to to the, the contest of the uh, um, uh, research communities in Africa um, and um, uh, develop a model that can allow the amplification of this without having us or, or someone specifically to be there, but could be like just uh, openly uh, propagated. And so I will uh, move on because I I'm way too sleepy and probably took way too much time. Uh, the last part was just uh, um, sharing opportunities with you. The only thing that I want to mention is that we are hiring for a specific uh, job to help us adapt to open reviewers to actually grant reviewing. So if you're interested, please uh, uh, check out the job and apply. And I want to thank you for your um, attention and apologize for taking way too long. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely, no problem, Daniela. It was fantastic. Thank you, everyone, for the presentations. We can take some questions. Um, Harry, would you like to go ahead and ask your question? Hello. Um, yeah, so my question was regarding um, society and how the actual commenting um, forms work uh, with regards to the groups. Um, how does a group form? Can any group of researchers form one? And is it possible to comment and start a dialogue around these preprints without belonging or having an, uh, an affiliation to any of these groups? Uh, hi, Harrison. Thanks. Thanks for your question. Um, so at the moment, the formation of those groups has been quite manual. Um, we've, on, in some instances, we've reached out um, to, to groups. In other instances, we've been contacted by groups um, and we've kind of worked with them um, to onboard them um, into the into the society network. Um, the reason why we elected to only allow evaluations from um, groups rather than from from individuals without without a, a kind of a group affiliation, as, as you say, um, a, a lot of it um, was for exactly the same reasoning um, that that Daniela's pre-review. Um, platform allows for um, anonymized um, reviewing um, is that we found that for us groups was a good way of kind of maintaining well there, there were two reasons really one of which was that the groups were a good way of maintaining protection for um, particularly vulnerable um, reviewers that they're, they're able to to participate um, in in this process without needing to um, associate their own identity, their own names. Um, and secondly, the, the groups, the groups really take on the mantle of the, the accountability um, and, and the vetting for their, for their own evaluators. Um, so the society it's, itself, we, we can kind of abstain from that. It's, it's the group's responsibility to make sure that uh, the, the quality of, of their evaluations is, is high um, and the people that, that are evaluating them you know they're they're qualified they're they're experts in the field um every group has its own uh home page on society its own kind of landing page um, and we use those pages to um, be completely transparent about each each group's process 
Um, we are we're working towards including the the ASAP Bio um, taxonomy. So ASAP Bio has has developed um, a taxonomy for um, outlining a, a particular review process. So that's everything from kind of the number of people that are involved in the review, um, whether they're they're blind to the authors, whether the authors are blind to them. Um, and that transparency is, is really so that the, the reader of, of that group's evaluations can make up their mind as to, you know, how much weight to, to give, give that group's um, opinions of a particular preprint. Um, in terms of, as I say, forming a group, um, really these, these groups are, are coming from anywhere. Um, at the moment, um, we have, you know, big organisations such as such as eLife, um, but we have kind of much, much smaller, much smaller organisations. Um, and, you know, there's there's also the opportunity for, for labs, for example, to, to get involved. Um, but yeah, please, if if you're if you're part of a group um, that you think could could fit that remit, then please do please do get in touch and, and we can work with you to you can to take you can review over. through pre review and then it will be a group on site. Yes, <laughs> perfect. That's, because that's, that's something that I was going to sort of ask: that is there any plan to have um, a society hosted group, or are there enough groups forming? You think that um, that that will ha there will be enough groups organically for people to be able to join and to become sort of part of and rather than take that mantle of accountability, as you talked about, um, on society itself? We, um, so at the moment, we don't have any, any plans for, for, for society, society created groups, um, but that's not to say that, that we're completely ruling that out, out of the future. Um, the best way for, as, as Danny says, the best way for, for particular individuals to get involved right now would be um, to, to review via pre-review um, and then pre-review pre -review then kind of takes on that, that accountability um, and the, the kind of the umbrella, umbrella protection for, you know, for particularly vulnerable um, reviewers, early career researchers in particular, those from, you know, the Global South minority groups, that kind of thing. Not just the pre-review, there are other great groups. So pre-lights and the pre, pre community teams, they have different ways of doing it. But um, sorry, just wanted to not just say the best way is to do pre-review, but that's a, a way. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, though, Anna, for the trust. <laughs> thank you for those answers and thank you for the great talks. Thanks, Anna. Um, I have got a question for Anna. So this, this published review curate model. So what does eLife review re rely on for reviews? Does it rely on multiple sources like site pre-review, pre-lights, or uh, does it have a favorite choice or how does this various platform come into the picture for eLife? At the moment, the platforms are kind of parallel to eLife. So we still just run our conventional uh, review process and we see how we can plug in the reviews we generate for eLife on the platforms. But at the moment, uh, we are just running our own peer review process, which we are running the same way we've always been doing it. So there is a reviewing editor who selects uh, reviewers, invites them, and then they generate peer reviews. So our emphasis inside eLife itself at the moment is to make those reviews suitable for public consumption, which means that once the reviewers have submitted the reviews, we will often go back to them and say, hey, this is not written in a language that would be entirely appropriate for public posting. Can you uh, soften it a bit or can you be a bit more clear on it so that because your review is really written for insiders, there is too much slang in it. So please make it a little bit more useful for the readers and not just for the authors and editors of the paper. So, but we are just working, what we are doing is working inside the life. So of course the idea would be to interact with these platforms, but the whole process is new. 
-hmm. So we only introduced it in 21, so that's like this year. And I must say that a lot of reviewers, we have very clear instructions on what we want the reviewers to produce. But as you probably know, people tend not to read any instructions. So we have to still to work out uh, how to do this better. And then I think we can converge more with the platforms. So this is the plan. Right. So. Uh, my next question is between eLife Society and Pre-Review, you've got a very uh, concerted aim to, to put the reviewers uh, in public and make it more equitable, et cetera, et cetera. But there is this other market of big journals which have their own uh, traditional processes. So how, what's the strategy or do you have a strategy to sort of combat that or operate in parallel and gain prominence in future? I think we have to gain prominence, we, get, we have to gain popularity, and then the big journals will follow. So what I see that, I mean, think about nature like six years ago. Uh, the embargo at nature was the biggest thing ever. Yeah? So if you were submitting your paper to nature, you were not supposed to, to talk about it. And then on the same day it was published and you were allowed to talk to the journals. Now, uh, all the papers that you submit to Nature can be preprinted, which means that everybody can read them on average one year before Nature will publish them. So this is a huge change for a magazine like Nature because they lost one of their most essential uh, assets, the novelty, the like the, pri the primary novelty of what they are publishing. So because now you see, oh yeah, good for these guys. I read this preprint like a year ago ago was very cool preprint got that they got it in nature so they got the curation step and from nature you don't even go and read the paper anymore because you have discussed it on your journal club like eight months earlier so this is a huge shift i mean uh, and so this shows that the community can vote with its feet and lead the way mm -hmm. so that in the end uh, the big publishers, they are interested in making profits, so they will follow what the community wants. So if we manage to introduce something that is popular with the community, they will follow. The same was with consultative peer review. I mean, I, you know, I've been dealing with digital biology a lot in my life. So it used to be like three huge reviews from uh, reviewers and then the, the editor throws it at you and say, do every single thing. Now, after we have introduced consultative peer review they change that so the editor would really read the comment say okay please do the comment of review one and the comment five of review two so they change that so again i mean the big journals i don't think that they are very innovative in what they are doing but if we can innovate and the community can say yeah this is a good thing for us they will follow because they what they want is not to lose the community yeah, that's very true. It's a great example with the embargo. Um, uh, so are there other are more journals than eLife that have signed up for this kind of uh, process or is eLife the only journal that's leading the way here? You mean for the preprints? Uh, so, for example, uh, the Review Commons, which has been uh, set up by Embo Publishing uh, uh, Group, so they have uh, also, in principle, they are interested in promoting preprints and also making reviews public. Mm -hmm. And all the big publishing houses now do have preprint servers, mm -hmm. so that's also a big change. So there is this, uh, uh, what the, I remember both uh, Nature and Elsevier have a preprint server. They don't publish reviews there, uh, but maybe if they see that it is an advantage, they will uh, follow. Uh, so, and uh, in principle, uh, there are more platforms and more initiatives for publicly reviewing preprints, especially COVID has uh, stimulated this very strongly. So I don't know, I cannot uh, say the exact names, but there are quite a few organizations, maybe Hannah or Daniela would know, who are actually trying to see how preprints can be reviewed publicly. So that there is a general demand for that, which was greatly heightened by COVID. Right. Thank you, Anna. 
Uh, if there are more questions, please use the raise hand functions and I can call out your name. Uh, so is, is Society and Pre-Review are sort of similar and dissimilar in the way that, you know, Society works on groups and uh, uh, Pre-Review is individual based. Uh, yeah, I didn't get the chance to talk about communities, but go ahead. <laughs> Right. So does, uh, does Pre-Review also have communities in, in, in itself building up or? Well, we're just starting an hour, you know, there, it's just a very, very uh, early stages, but um, the, the, it is individuals and, you know, the, the full Pre-Review can actually be authored by multiple uh, authors at the same time. Um, uh, and this is, was specifically developed to thinking about like, the uh, experience of a live stream for print journal club. So these like community reviews. Um, and uh, the, the thing that we launched more recently are these pre-review communities. And it's still like all of the software needs a lot of support, but the idea is to also create um, so an experience for the reader so that filters can happen um, across like reprints and reviews more around like a group that has developed their own trust uh, within that uh, the review group rather than, you know, selecting uh, a reviewer and only reading reviews from this particular person that may have, uh, whose name might be just like um, uh, kind of highlighted for because they're popular on Twitter or things like that. So kind of similar approach in design. Um, and what, what I'm hoping that is going to happen more and more as we kind of continue working together is that these different groups and communities that can grow on, on pre-review then are actually separately streamed to society so that they can be followed uh, because they, they actually create around different identities and their own different experiences and different topics, uh, but that's not yet happening. Right. Yeah, okay. so uh, at the moment, at the moment, we kind of everything that's coming out of pre-review um, is, is being displayed in within society under under the, the, the pre-review um, banner. Um, but it'd be right. great, you know, if, if we could kind of start start separating these out. Um, I think the the more options that there are available um, for for people to to kind of turn to and, and use, um, the better. I I you know I see I see all of these initiatives as as living kind of side by side. Um, and and just you know moving forward into the brave new world together. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds very exciting. I mean, I, I guess it's all too early and all too new, but but the change is important and it's all coming through. Um, I see no more questions, and I know all of you have either gotten up at weird times or staying up late. So I'll, I'll let you guys go. Thank you very much again for accommodating the time zones and giving these fantastic presentations and uh, putting forward all the new things to come to, to us. Thank you very much. Thank you for having, for having me and us. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. much. Thank Thanks, you. Anna. Thanks, Anna. Nice meeting you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Uh, bye.